We have a motto. And here it is. If it's in the Bible, we want it. If it's not in the Bible, we don't want it. Come on, say that with me. If it's in the Bible, we want it. If it's not in the Bible, we don't want it. Very good. So hope you uh, memorize that motto. We call our series Amazing Prophecies. And truly, prophecies are past, present, and future. Many prophecies have already been fulfilled. You can go through a number of them and put it check. They've been fulfilled. There are many prophecies that are right now, as we speak here tonight, are unfolding, are fast fulfilling. And then there are prophecies yet to be fulfilled, future prophecies. But you know, it's all connected because once you see how prophecies have been fulfilled in the past, it helps you to better understand how to understand and interpret signs of the times today and to be ready and ready for whatever is going to come. How many agree the devil will try to catch you by surprise? Now, sometimes people say, well, oh, Bible prophecy about the future. I mean, why should I, I have enough trouble in one day. Why do I want to focus on the future? Because you'll spend the rest of your life in the future. Because future is the next minute, the next hour, the next day. It's all connected. And very soon, Jesus is going to split the eastern sky. Jesus is going to come at a time when most are not ready. And many are going to look up and say, I knew he was coming. I just didn't know it would be so soon. Tonight, we shall see the march of nations and what everything is leading up to. Everything is connected. Say that with me. Everything is connected. Whatever news you watch, whether it's Fox News, CNN News, or maybe you're among the wise ones and don't pay any attention to all the news, especially politics. But everything is connected. And we must understand that the Word of God gives us the news behind the news. How many agree? The news won't tell you everything. You've got to have on certain eyeglasses a lens, view everything through the lens of Bible prophecy. Not only that, you and I, you might be a newsaholic, but you cannot keep up with all the news. You can't even come close to just a fraction of the news. So how do you know what news to pay attention to? The Word of God will tell you. The Word of God will help us to recognize the right prophecy fulfillments. The word of God will help us to recognize, say that word with me, recognize. The Lord will help us to recognize what news is important. Would you agree some news is just not really that important? Some news is not worthy of being news. So we must, through the help of the word of God, have wisdom to spot or recognize those things that are very significant, biblically speaking. Secondly, once you recognize by God's word what news to pay attention to, you can prioritize. Say prioritize. So we want to recognize prophecies in the headlines, and we want to prioritize with those things that God said would take place. I want you to take your Bible and turn with me to the book of, which book do you want to go to? Let's go to Revelation. Revelation. It's the last book for the last days. Amen? And right now we're living in a time that we might call the last chance. How many agree? God has given us many chances. Would you agree? This is it. Time is up. Look to your neighbor and say, time's up. Okay, so we're going now to Revelation. What chapter? We're going to go there to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. And let's look there at verse 3. This is very, very powerful. Give you a moment to locate that. Give you a moment to locate that. All right. Verse 3. Blessed is he who, number one, what is it? Reads and those who what? Hear the words of what? This prophecy and do what? Keep those things which are written in it for the time is near. So it's very clear, three things. 
a threefold blessing for those who will take time in Sandpoint, Idaho, will take time to read, hear, in order to what? Keep. So the Bible makes it very clear. There, there's no other book out of 66 books. They're all inspired. We need to study every single one of them. But there's only one book that begins with a threefold blessing pronounced upon those who are wise enough to invest time, to read, hear, and what, everybody? To keep those things which are written in it. So this book has never been more relevant, more timely, and more significant than right now in 2020. And can I say this, borrowing 2020, God wants us to have 2020 prophetic vision. Amen? He wants us to see things with penetrating gaze. He wants us to be able to have our eyes wide open. He wants us to have a riveted gaze upon fast-fulfilling Bible prophecies. So tonight, we're going to see the march of the nations and what everything is leading up to. Something biblical is happening in America and in the world that the prophets told us would happen. The patriarchs and prophets and apostles and Jesus himself all warned us about what's happening right now. And if we do not experience a revival now, when? And if not you, who? I'm going to agree, this is time for your revival. This is time for your revival. Look to your neighbor and say, it's time. It's time. It's time for a revival. And so everything is leading up to something. Everything is leading up to something momentous. Everything is leading up to something biblical, something prophetic, something apocalyptic. Have you noticed the type of uh, superlative adjectives that are used to describe different things that are happening, different current events? They'll say, it's never been this bad, or we never thought we would see this, or the word unprecedented. How about the word apocalypse? Wow, CNN using words like apocalypse and so forth, you know. And so apocalyptic, biblical proportions and so forth. You see these different words that have a prophetic connotation where people, even if they're atheists, sense something is happening that is unusual. And so everything is leading up to something mega, something prophetic. And we're going to discover night by night Our day in the light of Bible prophecy. We want to know what the Bible has to say. I repeat, and by the way, I will confess, I'm a firm believer that if I'm going to be a good teacher, repetition is the key to retention. Can you remember to say that? Repetition is the key to retention. So everything is leading up to something apocalyptic, something biblical. So how will the world end? Now, the psychics have their viewpoint. Atheists have their viewpoint. Scientists have their viewpoint. And we'll get into the biblical perspective here in a moment. But what are seven biggest threats to mankind today? Well, number one, catastrophe, asteroid impact. How big would an asteroid have to be to wipe out humanity? Number two catastrophe, super volcano eruption. Could a single volcano lay waste to the entire planet? Number three catastrophe, global nuclear war. How many nuclear bombs can humanity withstand? 1,000 nuclear bombs. Will humanity vaporize suddenly from a nuclear fallout? Number four catastrophe, Apocalyptic domino effect. Can an earthquake swarm bring the world to its knees? Number five, catastrophe. Pandemic. 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 I came from Texas, so you will see me wearing, donning a mask here and there. Yeah, I know. I'm one of these strange people from those cities. Those cities. No wonder you're out of the cities. But anyway. So pandemic, how many days does it take for a virus to go around the world? Can you predict when we're going to be out of the COVID era? 
<laughs> Thanks. You know something more than I do. Number six, catastrophe, solar storm of the highest caliber. How many years could a solar hurricane set civilization back? Will global warming, call it whatever you want, continue to its ultimate conclusion? So there's different scenarios. There's different uh, apocalyptic visions that people have about the future. But my friends, the word of God does not guess. The word of God is always spot on. The word of God has absolute pin pointed precision and accuracy. I repeat, God's word, let every man be called a liar, but not the word of God. Amen. And so number seven, catastrophe, gamma ray burst from space. What happens if a gamma ray burst hits the earth? All right. So those are seven. So how does the prophet Daniel describe the near future? Time of trouble. The book of Daniel forecasts, not the weather forecasts, but the prophetic forecasts, a time of trouble. And then it goes on to say, such as never was since there was a nation. So it characterizes it as being the worst ever or throwback to the dark ages and then more intense than that. Are we racing toward the final showdown on planet Earth? 6,000 years ago, there was a test in the Garden of Eden. God said, don't eat from that one tree. You can eat from every single tree. Just don't eat from that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We started out with a test. 6,000 years later, there's another test coming. It's the test about the infamous mark of the beast. Everything is leading up to the mark of the beast. Everything. And the United States of America will be the first nation to enforce the mark of the beast. I love the United States of America. I'm not one of those that gets on and says, you know, you know, United States is just so horrible. You know, wish I could get out of here and so forth. I'm not one of those. I love the United States of America. But I don't think we should be so proudful and prideful that we would put down other people or other nations. Amen. But I'm here to tell you, the word of God is not politically correct. So don't try to warp or try to, to mold the word of God to fit political opinions prevailing today. The word of God stands alone. It is our rock. Amen. And so... What is the future of the great cities of the world? I'm from Dallas, Fort Worth. Pray for me. <laughs> I didn't even know people lived up here. But anyway, all right. You know, this is absolutely, I just want to say this parenthetically. You all are absolutely spoiled. You should be having a smile on your face every single day. All right. So maybe we can make this an annual event or not. Okay, I know. <laughs> Come for six months, you know, during the summer, you know. But it really is beautiful, isn't it? So what is the future of our great cities of the world? We're going to learn more about that tonight and tomorrow night. Take your Bible and turn with me to Daniel chapter 12. Daniel chapter 12. Are we learning something already? Okay, so we're going to Daniel chapter 12. And uh, before the book of Hosea, we're going to look there at Daniel chapter 12 and verse 4. If you have it, say amen. Okay, give a few more moments. Daniel 12 verse 4. The book of Daniel and the book of Revelation are like inseparable twins. They need to be studied jointly. They complement and supplement each other. These are like bookends. They just need to be studied together. One explains the other. And by the way, there's a premise that we are working from here in Bible teaching night after night. And that is the word of God explains itself. Say that with me. The word of God explains itself. Say it again. The word of God explains itself. So it's really not how smart you are. It's rather, do you have a little bit of time to compare scripture with scripture? And so really I'm like a tour guide. 
I'm saying, come on, let's journey through this land of Scripture and this land of, of these strain, strange images. Come on, well, let's, I'm going to take you on a little tour here. And we're going to see some amazing, amazing things. And the Bible, remember, I'm like a tour guide, so I'm saying, well, look at what the Bible says over here about this Daniel 2 image. Oh, look at what the Bible says over there. The answers are in the Word of God. All I'm doing is like a tour guide saying, hey, did you see this? Did you see that? Did you see this? That's why I hope you bring your Bible each night. Daniel 12, verse 4. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and do what with the book? Seal the book until the time of the end. And what's going to happen in the last days? Many shall run to and fro. I think you did that to get here tonight. Running to and fro. And knowledge shall what? Knowledge shall increase. Right now, here tonight, we are experiencing this. Does God want to favor you with an understanding of end-time Bible prophecies? We just read from Revelation 1, verse 3, what? Threefold blessing pronounced upon you. Because it occurs to me, I'm looking at you, and you're reading, and you're hearing, and then you have to decide. Keeping what's written. So that's Revelation. Then here, Daniel God told Daniel, in the last days, people are going to experience an upsurge or increase of knowledge of understanding the prophecies that are embedded in the book of Daniel. So they're there, and God just wants us to take the time. And so I ask, does God want to favor you with an understanding of end-time Bible prophecies? Yes or no? All right, so we cannot keep up with all the rapid, startling changes in the world. Our world is changing at a rate that has never been seen in history. But where will all of these <clears throat> cultural shifts lead to? You're feeling it in your family, at work, different things happening that is telling us this world, blink an eye, let me put it this way. I say this on my YouTube channel a lot. Go to bed tonight, wake up tomorrow, and you may not recognize your world. We cannot keep up with all of the rapid, startling changes. Our world is spinning faster than ever with stupendous changes. Oh, yes. It's opening night. I just have to draw your attention to this fact. That the U.S. and Russia still have thousands of nuclear weapons ready to be launched within 15 minutes. Now, if you say... Mark, we do not have to worry about that. That would never happen. Mankind has the power to destroy the whole planet. The bomb of Hiroshima killed 100,000 people in a flash. The nuclear weapons we have today are the equivalent of 80,000 Hiroshima bombs. Now, I don't see in the horizon any imminent war or nuclear war. But things can happen overnight that were not calculated. And many feel, many experts feel that the way a nuclear war would break out would be by accident. John F. Kennedy said, mankind must put an end to war or war will put an end to mankind. Well, who's the next global superpower? We know that there in the 1980s, communism was losing its hold. Do you remember that? It happened overnight. The suddenness of these monumental game-changing events took the world by surprise. My good friend Mark Finley was over there at the time when communism was falling, and he had opportunity to speak to thousands and thousands of hungry people from the Eastern Bloc countries of Europe and from Russia. They were so hungry for the word of God. And so overnight, the Soviet Union fell. And then Saddam Hussein took advantage of the moment and invaded Kuwait in an attempt to annex Kuwait to our Iraq. And what happened? Well, this made CNN become the news that people wanted to watch because we were able to see those bombs with laser pre precision being dropped there on these uh, tanks and so forth there in Kuwait. And 
Kuwait was liberated by the United States and her allies, and thus we began known to be the sole remaining superpower. Not Russia, not China, no, no, no. The United States of America has been for quite some time now and is the sole remaining superpower. And from my perspective of revelation, the United States will continue to be a dominant force in end time events so that when the United States enforces the mark of the beast, the rest of the world will follow in domino effect. So who will the next global superpower be? Can it be China? Can it be Russia? Can it be European Union? Could it possibly be the EU? with all of her member states. Will Europe ever become a united political superpower? Oh, how about this? Is the internet becoming the next superpower? Something to ponder. Does God want us here tonight in Sandpoint, Idaho, does God want us to know the secrets of end time prophecies? Let's read this together. Let's read this with me. Uh, Deuteronomy 29, 29. Ready? Here we go. The secret things belong to the Lord, our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. What a powerful promise. And then Jesus said, read this with me. Here we go. And now I have told you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe. That is to say, why study Bible prophecy? That you may believe. What do you mean believe? Have more faith. Look to your neighbor and say, got faith? Now, this is, this is very, very important. The reason we study the word of God is to learn to trust Jesus more. We need to depend on him. More faith. So why study Bible prophecy? So that you can at least have a little bit of hope when you watch the news. Because, you know, you might say the news blues. But anyway, I want to go right now to an ancient prophecy that helps us to understand the past, the present, and the future. Because this ancient prophecy has good portions of it that have already been fulfilled. Portions that are being fulfilled and portions that will be fulfilled. And so I think about King Nebuchadnezzar. Go ahead and spell Nebuchadnezzar. We'll skip that for now. King Nebuchadnezzar, the great monarch of the Babylonian Empire, had a dream. He was thinking about the future and being any monarch of an empire. You want to know that your empire is going to last forever. But he went to bed thinking about these things, and then he had a dream, a very troublesome dream, a dream that he knew he needed to remember, a dream that had great import, that had great significance. And so the problem is when he awoke, it vanished. Now, how many of you have ever had a dream that you thought was important and it was so important that you forgot? Anybody? Anybody? As a matter of fact, sometimes perhaps you have a dream and you're like, I have, in that dream while you're dreaming, you're telling yourself, I got to remember this one. You won't. <laughs> this ancient prophecy or symbolic dream gives us 2,600 years of history in advance. 2,600 years. What does the future hold? You can rely on this prophecy because a good portion has already been fulfilled. Isaiah 46, 9 and 10, I read it. For I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there's none like me, declaring what, everybody? The end from the beginning. And then Amos 3, 7. Would you read this with me? Here we go. Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his what? Secrets to his servants, the prophets. Amos 3 and verse 7. Now, there's three things that we're going to see from the prophecy we're going to take a look at in Daniel. Prophecy reveals, and Daniel 2 prophecy reveals, number one, God is in control. God is in control. Not President Trump. 
Now you're wondering, is he a guy that likes Trump? Is he a guy? No, I know you're asking. You're wondering, are you for us or against us? <laughs> Sorry, you won't be able to pin me down. I preach and let politics do what it does. I believe we go to prophecy. Amen? PP, politics or prophecy? I choose prophecy. But seriously, you know, we're in election cycle, presidential election cycle, in case we hadn't noticed. It's nice to know right now God is in control. The devil does not have the last word. I've read the prophecies, and it tells me even in the book of Revelation, chapter 21 and 22, God has the last chapter. God has the last words. Amen. So God is in control. God is never caught by surprise. Number two, you can believe the Bible. And number three, we're living in the end of time. Prophecy is history in advance. History confirms the accuracy and reliability of remarkable Bible prophecies. Now, it's been said that since God knows the end from the beginning, therefore, history is his story because he knew it all in advance. So, King Nebuchadnezzar, there's the answer of how you spell his name. King Neb for sure, for short, right? King Nebuchadnezzar had this dream, and I want you to go there with me to Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2. Now, for sake of time, I don't have time to do all of the reading there, but I'm going to go through some highlights, and your homework will be read Daniel 2. Okay, so there in Daniel <clears throat> chapter 2, 12 chapters in the book of Daniel, we will go there, Daniel chapter 2, starts out with Nebuchadnezzar having this symbolic, impressive dream that he could not remember. It had vanished off the computer screen, so to speak. And so he couldn't remember it. And so at some unearthly hour, he rang his bell, and here comes part of his assorted group of astrologers and soothsayers and sorcerers and magicians. I mean, this, these comprised his presidential cabinet. You know, you've got to have some good advisors. And so, and then there were some intellectual elite, kind of like the mathematicians and the real, real brains there in, uh, in um, Babylon. And so an assortment of them came in at that unearthly hour and saw a very frustrated king, a king that looked like he was not a happy camper. And so he said, O oh, king, live forever. What's up? He said, look, guys, I pay you good. I take care of you. You've helped us out a lot here. I had a dream. Yes, king, live forever. I had a dream. Yes. And it's in a very important dream. Yes. This dream I need you to tell me the interpretation, and I need you to first tell me what I dreamed. They would like the opposite of that. He said, oh, king, um, there's nobody that can do that. Oh, really? Well, then I'm just going to kill you. So there was a swift, harsh death decree because these wizards and magicians, you know what they said? They said, king... They tried to pacify him and said, King, you give us the dream. We'll give you a good interpretation. And he said, look, guys, if you can give me the dream, then I know you'll have an interpretation. And so they were really stumped. And so that death decree went forth. And the swift, harsh death decree included the four young Hebrews, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were among the presidential elite. They comprise King Nebuchadnezzar's uh, cabinet of trusted advisors and so forth. So they were not there that particular night <clears throat> or particular morning, but they were still among them. Now, they were not astrologers, by the way, not to be confused with astronomy, but um, they were among the group. They were among the intellectuals, not the magicians and the soothsayers and the sorcerers. No, no, no. They wanted none of that. But they were known for their intellect and for their discernment and for their 
character, their, just the atmosphere that has surrounded them. They were different. They were superior. And King Nebuchadnezzar recognized that, but they would be included in the swift, harsh death decree. And so, <clears throat> you see, what were Daniel and his Hebrew friends doing in Babylon? Because Jerusalem was destroyed by King Nebuchadnezzar, 605 B.C. And so Daniel then said, look, we make a request. Please get word to the king. We have a request. Daniel requested for time to be granted by the king. And he assured the king that God would give, the God of heaven, the God of the Hebrews would give the dream. That request was granted. And I'm sure they breathe a little bit of a sigh of relief, but now God has to come up with a dream. But they weren't hoping God would come up with it. They knew that at times of extremity was God's opportunity to come forth. Isn't it just like the Lord to show up when you need him the most? How many can testify in your own life that over and over and over when you've needed him the most, he's been there. He's been there. And so the sacred vessels were taken to Babylon, the seven branch candelabrum, the other vessels that were there in the temple. And what did they do? When their lives were on the line, the young Hebrews prayed to God just like they most likely were taught by their parents. They were taught to pray. The most important thing that you can teach your children is to pray. Because if your children know how to pray, they're going to be okay. And as parents, isn't that uppermost in your mind? You just want to know your children are going to be okay. Am I right? Yes or no? All right. Now I'm a dad. And so I know. I know this love that you have for your children that we have. The number one thing we should do is do what Daniel's parents probably did. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's parents did. Train them to pray. There's two P words. Panic or pray. Now if you're going to panic, quickly turn it into a prayer. Amen. And so God gave Daniel the exact same dream that he gave the king. Now, did he give that dream while Daniel was awake or when he was sleeping? Sleeping, sleeping, because you can't get a dream while you're awake. But wait a minute, by them going to sleep after they prayed. Now, they could have said, we're up all night, man. We're going to pray, 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 panic, pray. No. They had enough confidence in God. They prayed and they said, now, Lord, this is your night and we rely on you. And they fell asleep in trust. Now, I don't know what frame of mind you go to sleep in, but I can recommend go to sleep like they did. Now, most of us have to sleep at night, but it's how you go to sleep. I have a video on my channel. It's about things you should never do before you go to sleep. That's part of your homework tonight. And so they fell asleep and God gave the dream. There is power in prayer. <sighs> yeah, that's me. You see, my dad is right there. Pastor in Hartford, Connecticut at a uh, baseball game with the church members. And that's me in the background. A rebellion really uh, was in full display before that church. That church I didn't attend, but I showed up there to play baseball. And how many remember the hippie year? You remember that? Well, I know it's having a comeback, but anyway. I needed a savior. And my parents prayed for me. And they got those church members praying for the pastor's kid. And God heard their prayers. There is power in prayer. You're a walking miracle. You are a walking miracle. How many agree the devil would have tried to take you out a long time ago? Don't, don't, don't doubt that. How many agree he tries to control and dominate and kill and destroy? But everybody say, I'm still here. 
And you're here for a reason. There's power in prayer, everybody. Daniel was highly favored of God with an understanding of prophecy. In the presence of the pagan king, Daniel gives all the praise and glory to the king of kings of heaven. And Daniel, then you'll notice this in Daniel 2, 31 to 35. And I'm just going to give you the highlights here. Daniel chapter 2. What chapter, everybody? Daniel chapter 2. So there you have a head of gold, chest of silver, thighs of brass or bronze. It's all right there, Daniel 2, 31 to 35. And the legs were of iron. But then something strange. The feet were made of iron and clay. Can you say instability? Would you agree this, this you, you know, iron and clay don't mix? And so, would you agree our world is on the brink? <laughs> Very unstable times. So, Daniel explained it. This is the dream. Now we will tell the interpretation of it before the king. Now, there's seven parts to this panorama prophecy. Part one. You are this head of gold. Do you think King Nebuchadnezzar would like to hear that one? Of course. It is one of the most famous and greatest cities of the ancient world. Played a major role in Bible prophecy. It was a city of wonders. Have you ever heard of this wonder? Hanging gardens of Babylon. Mistress of the kingdoms, Isaiah 47.5. Location 60 miles south of modern Baghdad in southern Iraq. Babylon at this time, 10 miles around. Rome, 6 miles around. Athens was 4 miles. The city was spread out in rectangle shape and surrounded by two sets of massive towering walls, as you see in the picture there. And they had plenty of food. Now, I know a lot of people are, with the COVID, stocking up, stocking up. Well, don't go crazy with that, but it doesn't hurt to have something in the pantry. But uh, Babylon was self-sufficient and self-sustaining. The city was renowned for its majestic temples and temple towers, plenty of temples and towers. In other words, they were very religious, religious center. Marduk was the chief sun god. They were sun worshipers. Astrology originated in that region. Did you know that? They worshiped heavenly bodies and they practiced divination. In Britannica Encyclopedia, the best known ziggurat is the seven-staged, there you see it, seven-stage Tower of Babel, uh, Babel at Babylon, 600 feet high on a base of 60 feet high. And there was plenty of gold. Matter of fact, the Temple of Marduk was 300 feet high, and outside it was covered with blue glazed brick overlaid with gold. The altar and throne were made from eight and a half tons of solid gold. How many would like a little chip of that right now? Golden city, no wonder. 200 temples, twice the size of Rome, population 200,000, and enough food to last for 40 years. I told you they had a lot of food. Dates, the Babylonian Empire dominated the world from 605 B.C. What does B.C. mean? Correct. B.C. means before Christ. So 605 B.C. to 539 B.C. But now for the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey dubbed it, but after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours. Daniel 2, verse 39. I don't think that went over so well with King Nebuchadnezzar because he wanted his kingdom to last forever. But here comes the bad news. Your kingdom is not going to last forever. Can I tell you this? Most people don't like certain prophecies in the Bible. We need to say, Lord, whether it's good news or what appears to be bad news, we want the whole truth and nothing but the truth. He removes kings and raises up kings. God is in control. Isaiah 13, destroyed like Sodom and Gomorrah, Babylon shall become heaps. How did Babylon fall? Babylon fell overnight without a fight. That's what happened. Matter of fact, the Bible predicted how Babylon would fall and who would do it. According to Isaiah 45, verse 1, it named the person, Cyrus, by name. 
Isaiah, the prophet, predicted how Babylon would fall and who would do it? Cyrus, named more than a century before he was born. Gates left open. Nations would fall before him, set God's people free, order rebuilding of Jerusalem. In other words, there was no doubt but that God is in control. And so what happened on that notorious night, the last night in Babylon, King Cyrus, in a military genius decision, he diverted the river Euphrates that ran right through the city. It was the life of the city. You can't live without water there in this barren place. Diverted the river Euphrates. And so the riverbed went down, down, down. And he was able to march his troops underneath the outer gates and the inner gates, two sets of gates, and the inner gates were left carelessly unlocked because at the timing, the, it was the last day of a long annual drunken celebration. And this was at a time where they didn't care about anything, nothing to fear, nothing to worry. Does it sound like our generation? And that night, King Belshazzar, King Belshazzar held a drunken feast for a lot of his leaders. And in a defiant act, he told some of his servants to go ahead and retrieve out of storage some of those sacred vessels that were taken from Jerusalem's temple and put in storage there in Babylon. And on this, in this fateful night, they got some of those vessels out. They probably illuminated or lit the seven candlesticks. And while they were drinking, the king, in a defiant act, in a presumptuous act, in a very brazen act, he had some of the intoxicating wine of Babylon fill up some of those sacred vessels. And he toasted to the gods of silver and gold. And all of a sudden, a bloodless hand emerged amidst the murky shadows of that night there in that banquet hall and wrote in fiery judgment letters, many, many tekel you farsen. Nobody knew what it meant. It was a cryptic message in everybody's sense because the wine goblets dropped, mouths dropped, everybody stopped drinking, the music stopped, the laughter stopped. Somebody crashed the party. His name is God. And I'm here to tell you that the parties are going to be crashed very, very soon. How many would rather be found not at the party, but seeking God? Now, Daniel wasn't at the party. And I hear there's a message there. We are to win the world, but not become one of the world. Nobody knew what it meant. And they said, go get Daniel. <laughs> because they knew that he knew these kind of things. And they sensed this is probably a message from God of heaven. They were right about that. And so what happened? Daniel said, O king, here's what it means. Thou art found in the balances wanting. You have been judged. And your kingdom shall be taken and divided to the Medes and Persians. And that's exactly what happened. Babylon fell that night and the king was slain that night. It happened. Babylon fell overnight without a fight. Now, this is very significant for the United States as well. 605 B.C. to 539 B.C. Psalms 9, 19. Let's, can we read this together? Here we go. Arise, O Lord, do not let man prevail. Let the nations be judged in your sight. Every single nation is judged by God. Past, present, and future. God is the one who raises up kings and removes kings. God is on the throne. There is a higher government. Can you say amen? And so, is America being weighed in the balances in heaven? Can I suggest to you that once in a while you might want to read 
a little bit about the forefathers. Like, they weren't perfect, but they did have a lot of warnings. Thomas Jefferson said, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just, that his justice cannot sleep forever. My friends, I know this may not seem politically correct, but the COVID pandemic is a judgment of God. The devil is the one that is out there to hurt and harm but when God withdraws his protective hand, now if God wanted to, he could just say, nobody's going to get this COVID. Can God do that? God is not willing that any man should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Second Peter 3, verse 9. The forefathers knew you, you can expect judgments. You can expect judgments. And I'm asking just like they were there at the last night in Babylon. My question is, is America drunk with sin? I'm here to tell you. These are days where you have to be careful of what you watch on news. As Christians, we have to be very, very careful. And if you have children, I recommend you don't get them in front of news too much. That's your call. Revelation 14, verse 8, another angel followed them, saying, Babylon has fallen. But this is speaking about Babylon today. It is fallen, that great city, it's symbolic. Because she has made all nations, including America, drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Would you agree? That's global. That's unfolding now and future. That's why we got other messages where we'll be dealing with that. So what is the future of many cities? What is the future of sin cities? Then sudden destruction comes upon them. First Thessalonians 5, 3. All you have to look at what happened to cities in the Bible. Well, that's all you have to do. Part two. Medes and Persians ruled 539 BC to 331 BC, represented by the silver chest. Part three. Then another a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over the, over the earth. Greece ruled from 331 BC to 168 BC. Let's see if you can guess. He was one of the greatest military geniuses in history. He was determined to rule the world. And another clue is, there he is. Who is it? Alexander the Great. I know a lot of you got that already. Alexander... Never lost a battle. Never, not even one. By the time he was 32, he had conquered the entire Mediterranean region and beyond. But God also spoke and judged Greece and said, thus far and no further. Part four. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron. It would be a nation that would have a long rule. Iron monarchy of pagan Rome. What world empire ruled next? The Roman Empire. It was the greatest empire the world has ever known. All roads lead to Rome. When in Rome, do as the Romans do. Romantic. All right. I don't know if it's connection, but anyway. For four centuries, Rome ruled over a quarter of the people on the planet. The rise and fall of an empire is absolutely fascinating. And there are the emperors, the mad, the brutal, and the brilliant. Who do you think I'm thinking of? Let's see if you can guess. Who do you think I'm thinking of? In particular, there's an emperor. The most famous of them all was Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar. Have you ever heard of this man? He overthrew the government he saved and brought revolution to Rome. I mean, I don't have a lot of time to deal with Rome because we've got to get to the, to the, more to the feet. And we're going to do that very quickly. Cruel entertainment. You thought entertainment was a more modern thing? They had entertainment for 6,000 years. There's been some type of entertainment. Matter of fact, there was a serpent in the garden at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And he was quite an entertainer, wasn't he? The devil is not a snake. The devil used the snake 
to allure Eve. And so, cruel entertainment. How many have ever heard of the Roman Colosseum? 50,000 spectators jammed the Colosseum. They had gladiatorial contests or games, public spectacles, mock sea battles, animal hunts, executions, reenactments of famous battles and dramas. A matter of fact, it's estimated that about 500,000 people and over a million wild animals died in those Colosseum games. Bloody entertainment. But what are kids looking on their iPhones? What are, what are Americans interested in? Go even to family-friendly Walmart. And what do you see there? Have you? I went to go get a hard drive here so we can be collecting all these messages and so forth. And <laughs> have you, you know, you've got to close your eyes practically to, to the stuff that is promoted at these stores. Bloody violence. It's really interesting. We want law and order, but we also want to watch things that are, have nothing to do with law and order. Bloody violence. My friends, we live at a time when mankind has corrupted their minds so much that they can't even discern, it seems, sometimes between good and evil. The Caesars demanded worship. Oh, how many people lost their lives there in that Roman Colosseum. The more Christians were martyred, this is the phenomenon that unfolded. The more Christians were martyred and persecuted for their faith in Jesus, the more they multiplied. The more they multiplied. And I got a question. You saw what they did in the Roman Colosseum. My question is, is America following in the footsteps of pagan Rome? I agree with you. That's exactly what's happening. History repeats herself. And so Rome ruled from 168 BC to 476 AD when Romulus Augustus was uh, taken down from the throne. And this marked the collapse of the Roman emperor. Part number five, the 10 toes represents the division of the pagan Roman empire. You would think, okay, First Empire, Babylon. Second Empire, Medo-Persia. Third, Greece. Then Rome. Okay, what's the fifth ruling empire? Then the fifth and the sixth and the seventh. No, no, no. This, God gave this prophecy with amazing, incredible detail. How many agree? God is a God of details. And so God knew that Roman Empire would be not succeeded and conquered, but would rather be conquered from within and be divided originally into 10 kingdoms. And of course, now it's even more than that. But originally, and a matter of fact, the, the original 10 original tribes or kingdoms find their, their uh, equivalent or evolved into the modern nations of Europe today with the exception of three. Heruli, Vandals, and Ostrogoths are extinct. But Alamanni evolved into Germans, Frag Franks, French, Saxons, English, Visigoths, Spanish, Burgundian Swiss, Lombards, Italians, Swavy Portuguese, and Heruli Vandals and Ostrogoths are now extinct. Part six. How did notable rulers attempt to unite Europe? I want to read this verse. Look at verse uh, 43. Verse 43. Are we learning something? Okay, verse 43. As you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another just as iron does not mix with clay. And so how did notable rulers attempt to unite Europe? Intermarriage. Then the rationale was if we can intermingle among heads of nobility, in other words, if the royal families will just spawn and mix and, and just, you know, hey, you know, you can marry my cousin and I can marry your daughter and all of this stuff going on, they thought, then we'll certainly be united. All in the royal family. A matter of fact, who's this beautiful woman over here? Do you know who this? That's Queen Victoria. That's right. Who became known as the grandmother of Europe. Why? Because this marriage and other marriages was all in an attempt as they would, France would have their nobility and the Germans and so forth. And so you ended up with, like I say, 
a royal family with a royal squabble. You remember Napoleon, who wanted to further his Napoleonic order. He wanted to unite Europe. He wanted one Europe. And Napoleon divorced Josephine and married Louisa of France, devastated his wife. Can you imagine that? She was devastated. And so in a palace in Denmark, the family tree of the royal families of Europe is pictured just as God predicted they intermarried. That was one of the strategies that they used to try to put together. You know, you know that saying, Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty Dumpty back together again. You know what? I hated that growing up because it had a bad ending. I like stuff that had a happy ending. I, I, I always would think like Humpty Dumpty, can't they put them together? All right. Anyway, they hoped that it would prevent wars and bring unity, but it didn't work. And many of wars fought in Europe were really family squabbles. God had predicted that they would not stick one to another. King James Version, they shall not cleave one to another. Then I think about Waterloo, synonymous with defeat. In 1815, artillery Napoleon was trying to further his Napoleonic order, trying to forge one world, uh, one Europe. And artillery bogged down in the mud from torrential rains. And the generals misunderstood commands. And some said that Napoleon wasn't even ready for this. Napoleon sensed that there was a divine hand that overruled and stopped his efforts to unite Europe. It said purportedly that uh, he said, God Almighty is too much for me. And so I think about then in the 1930s, a mad dictator rose. What's his name? It looked like Europe may be controlled by Hitler. And here's what he said. Lord... Now bless, yeah, it's a prayer. Lord, now bless our battle and our freedom and therefore our German people in fatherland. I believe today that I'm acting in the sense of the almighty creator. By warding off the Jews, I am fighting for the Lord's work, he said in 1936. What's amazing is not only that he was a mad dictator, but that so many would follow him. There were some very impressive and miraculous turning points in World War II. Now, how many of you have relatives that fought in World War II? Some have passed away and so forth? Sure. Well, how, you know what? We have freedom. And we owe a debt to all those veterans that were fighting in World War I, World War II, Vietnam, and so forth. Where would our world be without seeking to foster freedom? The British were about to lose their army at Dunkirk. Remember that? And the Battle of Dunkirk saved the British army from death and capture. And God even used the foolishness of some of Hitler's decisions to weigh in on some turning points in the war. There were different turning points in that war, World War II. Then there was the invasion of Normandy at D-Day on June 6, 1944. And uh, President D. Roosevelt prayed a prayer on the evening of June 6th. And you can actually go online and you can actually hear that prayer. And he called it, let our hearts be stout. And um, Roosevelt served several uh, terms as president. And then usually one day in a century rises above others as an accepted turning point or historic milestone. It becomes a climactic day or the day of that century. So this was certainly a, a turning point. It was dubbed as Operation Overlord. Largest armada in world history. Ships carried more than 100,000 American, British, and Canadian soldiers across turbulent waters of the what? Of the English Channel. In June of 1944, the daring but successful Allied invasion of Hitler's fortress Europe at Normandy, France, pushed the dictator's ambitions into defensive mode. The Third Reich had the ability to call upon up to 50 divisions in the vicinity of Normandy to react to an allied attack. I know where I'm going. Are you still with me? All right. I'm going somewhere. But make no mistake about it. Only God could prevent this all-out invasion from turning into a disastrous, bloody defeat. The odds were against them. Bridgehead infantry units... After pushing through tough Nazi coastal defenses, could have faced a devastating German counterattack by three divisions held in reserve. Hitler made some big mistakes. 
Hitler refused to give the order to commit them until after it was too late. God's word. God's word. Hallelujah. God's word cannot, never has, never will fail. You can bank on it. Through God's wise providence, history unfolded. Hitler was toppled. God, you know what? It was around the time when Hitler was at his pinnacle when it looked like he was going to pull it off. When the editor for the magazine Signs of the Times made a forecast based on Daniel 2 that Hitler would fall. Looked like he was in la-la land, but you know what? It's exactly what happened because he read Daniel chapter 2. God intervened. How many times has God intervened in the world? We will know during the millennium. But will Europe ever be politically united? Newsweek magazine a while back, the European Union can barely hold itself together and Putin knows it. Well, you know what? What do we have the General Assembly Hall for? To try to unite. Will Europe ever be politically united? Churchill said, we must build a kind of United States of Europe. In this way, only will hundreds of millions of toilers be able to re regain the simple joys and hopes which make life worth living. The Rome Treaty was signed 1957 and came into force 1958. It created the European Economic Community. The Treaty of Rome set the stage for the EU to become an economic, military, political colossus. Jean Monnet, United States of what? Of Europe. Once a common market interest has been created, then political union will come naturally. And the Iron Curtain's fall in 1989 that enabled eastward enlargement of the European Union. And so the European Union, 500 million people, 28 countries, but can you say Brexit? Exit? Every political move matters in today's world. The A at G20 summit, it looks more and more like Trump against the world and so forth. National interest, the European Union has a currency problem. European Union is reportedly preparing to strike back if Trump starts a trade war over steel. Japan, European Union, European Union is constantly in the news. And some are wondering who else is going to bow out of the EU. Negotiation begin over British split from European Union. In the wake of the Brexit vote, it seems to have the whole world on the edge of their chairs watching for the next moves in Europe. What's going to happen? And do you know who is in favor of the EU staying together? I'm not going to tell you. You have to stay tuned. In the wake of the Brexit vote, it seems to have the whole world on the edge of their chairs watching for the next moves in Europe. EU states start to examine whether UK is likely to reverse Brexit. But what many people don't know is that what we see happening in Europe right now is a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. God gave to King Nebuchadnezzar a Babylon, a dream that predicted the future of the world from that point and onward. And so God told the king in this dream that there would be four world empires starting Babylon, followed by Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome right in line. Now, I just have minutes left, but really focus on this. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, divided Europe, and then trying to unite Europe. After Rome would come divided Europe, represented by the ten toes of the metal image that God had shown to this king in this fascinating, remarkable dream. So we can see the hand of God throughout world history and about the European Union. We can see Bible prophecy rapidly unfolding. Daniel 2.43 disallows any possibility for Europe to politically unite. I'm going to skip through a couple of slides if that's okay. Don't worry, there'll be a lot of stuff in the handouts. The Bible says, they shall not cleave one to another. Daniel 2 and verse 43 Efforts to unite Europe will not fix the problem. This world will never be fully politically united, but they will be united to enforce the mark of the beast. Part seven. What is the next world empire? 
What's the next world kingdom? Who's the next world order or the next uh, global superpower? Look at this one. As a matter of fact, I want everybody to stand. Everybody stand. And in this part seven, I want you to read the scriptures with me, okay? Everybody together. You watched while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. What does the rock represent, everybody? Who's the rock of our salvation? Who's the rock of ages? Who's the rock that will not roll? We're talking about Jesus Christ. Everybody, all the kingdoms of the world will become like chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. Read it together. The stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Everybody. And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never, ever, ever be destroyed. So the Bible makes it clear. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms. Everybody, everybody. And it shall stand forever. How long, everybody? Forever. This is an eternal kingdom. Read it together with me. The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. My friends, listen to me. This is very important. David said this. I'll just read it alone. Hear my cry, O God. Attend to my prayer. From the end of the earth, I will cry to you. When my heart is overwhelmed, everybody, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. How many agree there's somebody better than you and higher than you and more perfect than you? He's the one that died for you. He's the one that cares for you. And he's king of kings and lord of lords. And he's coming soon. Are you going to be ready? Are your children going to be ready? There is nothing more important right now on October 9 than knowing before you hit that pillow tonight, knowing right now that you're right with God. And the Bible makes it very clear how to be right with God. And that is this. Jesus said this when he was in on trial. You will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Jesus said that he was going to come. And he said, whoever falls on the stone will be broken. But on whoever it falls, it will grind them to powder. So you have a choice here tonight. Either fall on the rock of Jesus Christ through repentance and surrender and faith. Or the rock will fall on you when Jesus comes. You won't be ready. And in Revelation 6, you'll try to cry out for the rocks to fall on you. And to hide you. The rocks to hide you. Fall on the rock of Christ Jesus. And be broken. Surrendered. Abandoned to Jesus Christ. I'm going to pray. And it's in this prayer, I urge you. Give your heart 100% to Jesus Christ right now. There is nothing as we close. There's nothing more important right now. Than you and Jesus making sure that you're trusting him right now. Right now, right now, right now. You don't know about tomorrow. But you have Jesus right here, right now. There is healing in this house. There is restoration in this place. There's the rock of Jesus. He's for you. He cares for you. He will help you. You can't save yourself. If he rules on your throne, you'll rule with him on his throne. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you so much that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Thank you, Lord, that we're on the winning side, Jesus' side. And I pray, dear Lord, that every single person here tonight would fully, completely surrender to you, dear Jesus. Perhaps many have come in here tonight. You were already surrendered, but maybe the Lord's put his finger on something. I pray, dear God, that we would trust you as our rock, and I pray not one person, Jesus, would leave here tonight without knowing that Jesus is your, their Savior. Jesus, I beg of you. I plead with you. 
that not one person would leave here tonight without being fully surrendered to Christ. Help us to fall on that rock. And we love you, Lord, because you love us. Bring us back safely tomorrow night. Help us to keep learning more about Jesus and his prophecies. In Jesus' name, amen. Be seated for a moment. Oh, that's it. we already did the drawing and everything, so we're good. We'll go home so that you can come back. We love you in the name of Jesus. God be with you.